Hey everyone and welcome to The Year Was, a podcast all about today. I'm your host Michael Montalvo and together we take the history train back in time once again to discover what makes today truly unique. For the next few minutes we continue to gather random nuggets of trivia to make you sound smart or just drop that little fact that makes other stuff and say, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? On this episode, we examine the events that occur today, September 4th. Okay, everyone, pull out your camera and take a picture. Did you push a button? There have been many designs for cameras throughout the years. In fact, it can be traced all the way back to 1021 when Iraqi scientist and writer Ibn described a device that, in many ways, resembled a camera in his book of optics. The first portable camera was designed by Johann Zahn in 1685, but then progress stalled until 1814, 130 years later, when Joseph Nisifor Niepce took the first photograph, followed by what I assume to be the first selfie. These two actually share credit for the invention of the camera, but these photos were not permanent. Louis Degas I rolled that R, actually, it sounded pretty good. In 1829, is credited with inventing the first ever practical photography. He's been over 10 years developing this method for effective photography, and progress was made through his partnership with Nisifor. However, their ownership rights were sold to the French government, who started developing studios throughout the country. So now, in March of 1840, Alexander Wolcott and John... Johnson Sr. received the first American patent for the Daguerre-type mirror camera, which didn't use a lens. The camera worked the same way that a Celestia telescope did, using a concave mirror, and cut portrait photography time from 30 minutes to only 5. As you can assume, photography was not mainstream at this point, but that all changed with the man by the name of George Eastman. The year was 1888, and on this day, George Eastman patented the first roll film camera and registered the name Kodak. The thing about the original Kodak camera was that anyone who could press a button could now take a photo. Cameras up to this point required the use of a glass plate negative, but Eastman developed a camera that came preloaded with 100 exposure rolls of film that produced circular images. A wind key was used to advance the film, and it was originally fitted with a rotating barrel shutter, although the high cost caused it to be replaced with a sector shutter the following year. A V-shaped sight allowed users to line up shots, and the shutter was set by pulling up a string and then pressing a button. Originally, this sold for $25, which actually amounts to about $705.38 in today's market. Users would take the photos, then send the camera back to the factory to have the film developed for a then cost of about $10. Then the camera was returned with a fresh roll of film. Kodak, as we all know, are still making cameras today and are among the most user-friendly while still delivering top quality. And if you're looking for a camera, they are a great choice to go with. They didn't pay me to say that, but if anyone at Kodak wants to reach out to me, feel free. Let's switch centuries and talk a little bit about Orville Faubus. During the summer of 1957, the Little Rock Nine, a group of African Americans, enrolled at Little Rock High School, which had been up to that point an all-white school. They were supported by the Supreme Court's recent decision in Brown v. Board of Education, 1954, which had declared segregated schooling to be unconstitutional. Despite this backing, they were warned by the Little Rock Board of Education not to attend the first day of school, which they did not. And on the second day, they arrived accompanied by a small interracial group of ministers. What they encountered, though, was a mob in front of the school who shouted, threw objects, and threatened their lives. That wasn't their only obstacle, however, as they were met with a more serious opposition. The year was 1957, and on this day, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus 
called the Arkansas National Guard to block the school's entrance and the entry of the African-American students known as the Little Rock Nine. What Favis had done previously had been to declare his opposition to integration. That's why he called the Arkansas National Guard in, but this didn't end after one day. The confrontation and the attention this brought to racism and the civil rights got to the point where President Dwight D. Eisenhower, Governor Faubus, and Mayor Woodrow Mann discussed the situation over 18 days while the students stayed home. Eisenhower actually federalized the National Guard to remove them from the governor's control, and on September 23rd, they returned entering the school through the side door to avoid protesters. They were still discovered, and protesters became so violent, they attacked African Americans in the crowd and reporters of Northern Papers. Not to be deterred, the Little Rock Nine returned September 25th, this time protected by the 101st Airborne. At the end of the school year, 1958, Ernest Green became the first African-American graduate of the Little Rock Central High School. But here's the thing. Bobas was re-elected in 1958 and still opposed to desegregation. He had all of Little Rock schools closed. Many Southern schools followed this, and they implemented programs designed to subsidize white students' attendance in private segregated schools, which were not covered under Brown versus the Board of Education. Little Rock did not reopen their schools with a desegregated student body until 1960, but they did open, continuing the Civil Rights Movement. The last thing I have is a bit of baseball trivia. The year was 1991, and on this day, the asterisk was removed from Roger Maris's home run record. The asterisk was added to Maris's 1961 record of 61 home runs because it was made in more than 154 games, that being the pre-expansion schedule. Babe Ruth held the record previously with 60 home runs. I didn't make the schedule, Maris once said. And do you know any other records that have been broken since the 162-game schedule that have an asterisk? I don't. Maris died in 1985, but after an eight-man panel voted, the asterisk was removed in 1991 and gave Maris the recognition that he deserved. And that's going to do it for us today. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the audio version on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, pretty much anywhere you get your podcasts, links in the description. If you like the podcast and you want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and lets me know what direction to keep this going in. And hey, if you liked it, share it with a friend. They might like it too. And you can find me on social media and at YouTube at The Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.